Hello, I am Daisy, your hostess. If you're new to my channel, welcome, welcome. And to our subscribers, welcome back. We are now in the second chapter of the book titled How to Tap Your Hidden Sources of Energy by Elmer Wheeler. And I believe that we all can learn something from each other and that there's no need for competition because what you're looking for is already looking for you. And I also believe that each one of us has the potential to become a better version of ourselves if we choose that. I am of the opinion that we should thirst for this ever-growing improvement. And, you know, in this seeking of the ideal, we can improve not only ourselves, but we can also add value to the human race growing onward and upward in a metaphoric way. And it is with this intent that this book has been added to the channel. Too often I hear people say that they lack momentum or energy, and perhaps this author may offer us a pearl of wisdom or two for those who are seeking it. While some of the language, I may admit, may be a little bit different to our time, because this is turn of the century, and I assure you that while some of the language may be somewhat antiquated, and I believe in our previous chapter, the author mentions both uh, Hoover and Eisenhower, who were presidents during his time. And we could see that, you know, there's been so much advancements because of technology and also the, the expansion of the culture. So the culture also changes the language. But I assure you that the wisdom that we can find in these words in this book are going to be invaluable. And, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, the listener to this right now is a housewife, if there's still such a thing, uh, as well as a business owner or a manager. Because surely, who doesn't want to have a little more pep, a little more vim, a little bit more vigor, so that what we can do is enjoy more of the life that we have, whether it's, you know, finishing work and coming home to, to our families and, you know, taking up our little hobbies. We would like to, you know, learn how to take some of the energy, conserve some energy, and then have a little extra energy for our own self-expression. So with that, let's go ahead right into chapter two. Sit back and enjoy. How to Tap Your Hidden Sources of Energy by Elmer Wheeler. Chapter two, Enthusiasm. The energy secret doctors prescribe. The race by vigor, not by vaunts, is won. What is one man's work is often another man's pleasure. Horace Sutton, the travel writer, is looked upon enviously by armchair travelers who say, boy, what a job in life. But is it? Sutton feels it is work because it is something he must do each day to make a living. As distinguished from the casual traveler or tourist out on a holiday, Sutton does his job enthusiastically, and it appears like fun. He sure keeps banker's hours, says an envious man of a neighbor who always seems to have time for coffee breaks, gin, rummy, golf, and long weekends. But what the envious friend did not know was that the neighbor was making pleasure out of work. He knew how to combine business with pleasure. Furthermore, he was an enthusiast who made work look like pleasure. The Big Energy Secret And therein lies a big secret of energy people. People who get things done. The one word. Enthusiasm. The Mayo doctors recognize the value of enthusiasm, and that is why many doctors will not operate on a person who lacks enthusiasm to live. Without enthusiasm to live, they will say, the danger of post-operative death is too high. They know this big secret ingredient to success and happiness in life. E-N-T-H-U-S-I-A-S-M Enthusiasm Give me an enthusiastic person and I'll teach him how to sell says the sales manager of any corporation, for he knows that enthusiasm is the magic that makes stars of men. What is enthusiasm? What is this enthusiasm doctors want in people to keep them alive and that sales managers want in salesmen to make them stars? 
Enthusiasm is the sparkle that made Jimmy Durante, cursed with a long nose, a star. It is what put over Martha Ray, despite her big mouth, and that made a star of wide-eyed Eddie Cantor and big-eared Clark Gable. Enthusiasm of eye, voice, movement, action, and thought that made each forget the handicaps he was born with. They learned the trick of putting themselves over with audiences and the art of selling themselves to others through enthusiasm. The trick of getting things accomplished. Radiate Enthusiasm George M. Combe often had a bad show until the final act, and then out came the American flags carried by gay girls in shorts and led by a trumpet player and drummer. This flurry of sound and noise raised the listener off his seat as he applauded enthusiastically and shouted, Brother, what an ending to a show! He was sold on the enthusiasm of that last moment before the curtain, and he forgot the bad parts of the show. You might say, therefore, that a big trick of the trade in putting yourself over with others is radiate enthusiasm. Beam over people, smile over them, pat them on the back mentally, lean with them, bend with them, cheer with them, enjoy them, and they'll enjoy your peppy response. It's an art to maintain goodwill, good friends, and good health. The art of enthusiastic response that surgeons require before they'll take out your gallbladder. Remember, enthusiasm is catching. You can't go to an enthusiastic clinic and get enthusiasm, nor can you find it by listening to a pep lecture, nor can it come from a hot mud bath at a spa, a massage table at the country club, or from a bottle of advertised pep pills. Enthusiasm comes from your own inner desire. You must have a desire to do something before you can have enthusiasm to generate to get the desire accomplished. You must have a daydream, a castle in Spain, something to shoot at, a target in life, and to desire it so greatly that you bubble with enthusiasm, for desire is what stimulates enthusiasm. He has no desire to live, says the surgeon. I will not operate until he has this desire. The doctor is right. Without desire, the patient lacks enthusiasm to fight for his post-operative life. He gives up much as a bum gives up and saunters the side alleys of life, lacking a goal, a desire to get ahead, and the enthusiasm to put himself over the goalposts. Where does energy spring from? It comes from your thoughts. Your thoughts set up an electrical and chemical reaction inside the body that creates energy. That is why a person with drive, with things to do, with a goal, is never lacking in energy. The more intent on his target in life, the more energy his thought waves will produce. Enthusiasm is catching. There is one good thing about enthusiasm that the doctors and bosses soon discover. It is contagious. It is as catching as a head cold. It is like a smile. Start smiling as you walk to work and watch your smile reflect itself on faces of all you meet. The smile is contagious. So is your enthusiasm. Start getting enthused about a trip to Mexico and watch others catch your enthusiasm. Enthusiasm generates enthusiasm in others, boils them, stirs them up, puts a flush of color into their faces. And there you will say as a person of pep and vitality, vim and vigor. And not from a bottle, either but from the enthusiasm you cast in their presence that stirred them up, body, soul, and mind. Sausages and Enthusiasm H. C. Reiter came to Dallas, Texas from Germany. He always got enthused when he described how good the sausages were in Germany. His enthusiasm made mouths drool, and then, one day, he opened up Carl's, a butcher shop that specializes in old world sausages. Now everyone who eats a Carl sausage gets enthused too. Sausages and enthusiasm are catching. The story of Dick Kelly. Where does Dick Kelly get his enthusiasm, you ask? 
This youthful fellow was president of a firm that he started when in the Navy and last year did over $4 million of business. Callie brought things home from his travels with the armed forces as gifts to friends. Other friends offered to pay him if he'd bring back similar items. Soon he was out of the army and started to travel and bring home gifts for friends, adding a small profit. When all his friends had all they needed, Kelly went to neighbors, then door to door. People liked gifts from around the world. They liked this young man's energy and vigor, along with a wife who wasn't far behind Dick with her own brand of enthusiasm. Dick, still under 40 years of age, is now president of World Gifts and employs over a thousand women who sell his gifts at shows conducted in homes, much as aluminum and kitchenware is sold through the party plan. Here were two people with desires, one to make the world's best sausage, the other to bring gifts from around the world to people. Both desires created enthusiasm that grew inside each, and today you'll remark at the stride of each man as he walks across the room, shakes your hand, bobbles with pep, pictures of health without pills. How to catch a cat. Did you ever know the trick to catch a cat? I learned it from Lars Eric Lindblad, who noted how people burned up needles energy trying to get things done. What a waste of time and energy, he'd say, watching a person trying to sell someone an idea or endeavor to secure better work from an employee. Spinning his wheels, that's what he's doing, Lindblad would say. That person doesn't know how to catch a cat. I asked him, what do you mean, how to catch a cat? It is this, said Limblot. You sit quietly back, burn no energy, and make the cat come to you. If you run across the room to catch the cat, he'll run from you. You will burn up a lot of calories trying to catch a cat that way. You do it this way. Lindblad then made little noises with his fingers, and soon the cat in the room we were in pricked up its ears. See, you have caught his attention. Now watch him come closer. The cat did. He was interested in the noises of Lindblad's fingers being snapped together. Finally, the cat came within smelling distance of the fingers and Lindblad snapped him up. It was that simple. It was a great show of conservation of energy and of putting enthusiasm into a cat to want to investigate the finger noises. How well we might catch interest of people the same way, by radiating enthusiasm that brings them to you, saving you steps, a great lesson in how to save energy. How to sell enthusiasm. The art of instilling enthusiasm into others to get things done is a big secret of people of PEP. It is the big difference between the executive and the worker. The executive inspires others to do the work. He executes, he stimulates, he generates enthusiasm into workers, and they respond by doing finer work. There is an old saying, the man of enthusiasm excels, the man of know-how. You will buy a paring knife from a hawker at the fair because of his great enthusiasm in peeling spuds. He seems to enjoy his work, and that is perhaps a big secret in gaining enthusiasm. Enjoy yourself. For in enjoying yourself, you lighten the load. Pencils and memo pads. If you'd prolong youth and energy, then keep pencils and memo pads from under your pillow. They disturb sweet dreams. Replace them with a good dime novel. A day in Mexico. I asked a Mexican one day en route to the Toluca marketplace, may I buy one of the many clay pots you have in the basket on your head? He smiled, saying, At the Toluca Marketplace, senor, I will sell my clay pots. I informed him I would light his load and buy several right here on the highway. Ah, no, he replied again, hardly stopping in his jogging stride. Why not sell them here, senor, and make it easier on yourself, I asked. He replied, If I do, you will be cheating me. Cheating you? Of what? I exclaimed at the peon's frankness cheating me of the joy of talking with you in the marketplace. He said, and I saw his point. He wanted the joy of conversation. This meant more than money. With joy, there was no work. But without joy, then selling was a hardship. Rule. Enjoy what you do. 
Since enthusiasm stems from desire, the bigger your desire, the more enthusiasm you'll have. Find several desires. Maybe a baker's dozen of desires. In this way, you make sure never to run out of a desire to do things. A person without desire is a person without life, as surely as the man without a country, or the seller without something to sell, or at a Hofsrau with nothing cooking. Ships drift aimlessly without a harbor in sight. Edison had a desire to create a light bulb. He had no weariness even after 10,000 mistakes, to which he remarked, Now I know 10,000 ways not to do it. No pastor or sock without a vision ever in front of them. For visions give you tremendous strength, much as a shot of adrenaline. So develop a vision, be it ever so fantastic, childish, remote, difficult to accomplish, silly, noble, for from daydreams come castles. How to live longer. Go on a vacation with guide map and not a daily reminder of things to do. You'll last longer in life. Don't be overly content. Contentment is fine at times, but not all times. The Mexican slumbers under his sombrero, but only during the heat of the day when all desire to sell clay pots is gone from him temporarily. Overly content people have no ambition therefore lack enthusiasm and are inclined toward tiredness. For often, tiredness is a disease of the complacent. Relax too much and you can't get into motion or generate enthusiasm to create energy in you. Feet on the desk people who overdo relaxing soon have the chair pulled out from under them. It is hard to be enthused when you are tilted backwards or to climb a fence tilted toward you or to kiss a girl tilted away from you. Chapter Success Story One day a man with a vision and a desire to make his daydreams come true opened up a five-cent store and, as told by T.R. Lynn, recently at the New York Sales Executives Club, that event became the forerunner of our Woolworth five and ten cent stores. The man's name was Frank W. Woolworth. His store was only 14 by 35 feet in size, rent unpaid, and his total inventory cost only $410 with $1.64 in wrapping paper and $17 in store fixtures. But from such a humble beginning rose 2,300 stores in America, 1,000 in Germany and Britain, and recently some eight stores in Mexico. What decisions shaped such an enterprise? Lynn will tell you. Woolworth had enthusiasm. He had no know-how, but lots of pep and vitality to open up a five-cent store. He knew what he wanted and went out and enthused others. Frank Woolworth's idea was to change retailing from how little could be sold for how much to how much could be sold for how little. He inspired managers to run his stores. He delegated authority. He got things done by letting many hands help him. And as he profited from his plan, so did hundreds of his fellow workers. Chapter Thought Show me a person with unbounded enthusiasm and I'll show you a person who knows the following. That enthusiasm is catching as a cold. That enthusiasm excels know-how. That joy in work distills energy. Build up enthusiasm and tap your pep. Step one, take a long, fast walk. This dissipates tension, relaxes the body and makes room for enthusiastic ideas. Step two, indulge in a cold shower, a sure way to get energy started. Step three, Engage in a lively conversation, but minus argument, and watch enthusiasm rise in you. Step four, forget your problems in a good movie or a play. Step five, get lost in a TV program, any kind. Step six, try a cup of hot tea. It warms up stomach and mind. Step seven, play any kind of game, cards, tennis, old maid. Step eight, Laugh. It softens tension fast and builds up enthusiasm. End of chapter. Stay right here because we're going to move right into the next chapter right here on this video. So hit that like button, sit back, 
and enjoy. Chapter 3 How to Conserve Energy by Doing Things Right the First Time A work well begun is half done. If a penny saved is a penny earned, then certainly energy saved is energy conserved. By this I mean, if you can save energy during the day, then that is as good as finding a stockpile of hidden energy. It is as good as discovering a new Alexa or a new system of charging your battery. And the best way to save and conserve energy is to do things right the first time. This saves stress and strain in having to do the same thing over and over again at great loss of energy. People who make a habit of doing things right the first time seldom go over their plimsoll mark. On the other hand, there is the windmill type of person, forever rushing hither and thither, always out of breath, always gasping. I never seem to get things done. Like the windmill itself, these people go only in great circles and end up where they started. The art in proper planning. Usually these people play the day by ear. They do what comes to their mind on the spur of the moment and soon they are wound up in their own windmill while their get it done friends sit back in the contentment of a job well done. The shortest distance between two points is the straight line, yet the play-by-ear people seldom take time to map their day in a straight line. They failed to learn that the big secret of saving energy is proper planning of each day. People who plan their day seldom end up with five o'clock headaches and backaches, for they have taken the shorter road with less bumps and detours to jar their nerves to eat up energy. These straight-line people go farther each day, yet hardly seem to work at it. Two rules to use. You might say there are two good rules to save energy. One, map your day in advance. Two, move only in a straight line. Two simple rules of common sense conservation of energy. But will people apply these rules? Some will, some won't. You will always find some people in a squirrel cage of events getting as far as the squirrel does in his cage. This routine may be fun for the squirrel, but most human beings don't get any pleasure from circulatory motion that gets them nowhere. However, if you plan your day in advance and go only in a straight line, then you accomplish the big thing that saves energy, doing it right the first time. It is only logical that a housewife who must bake the cake twice, sweep the kitchen twice, rewash dishes several times, is needlessly spinning her wheels, burning up energy. She greets hubby at the doorstep with aspirin tablets in one hand and a dust cloth in the other. This wife has burned up energy and is tense and nervous. She should sit down each day and map her day's work. Then, proceeding in a straight line, she would do it right the first time. What motion engineers say. All right, you say, but tell me, how can I do things right the first time to conserve my energy? Ask any economist for this answer. He will tell you there is an easy and a hard way to do any job, from housework to factory assembly. Economists will study motions made by workers and try to reduce the motions. In so doing, the motion engineer cuts down on use of energy just as he'd cut down on use of electricity if he found an easier way to do a job. You must study your day's assignments from the regular chores to the newer work that crops up daily. As to your chores, these can be put into an assembly line pattern so that you stick to the kitchen, let's say, until it is finished, then move into other rooms one by one with no need to turn back for a forgotten broom or dust cloth or decide to make a telephone call that gets you into the bedroom, then forget the laundry must be bundled, so out into the laundry you go just about the time you think, my gosh, I left the water running in the bathroom. That's really going in circles, and your stockpile of daily energy soon runs low. Steps saved save you. Practice this rule. Cut down on footsteps. A step saved in a kitchen or office is a step earned. 
It is amazing how many steps you can save if you become step conscious. Think about your steps. Make yourself conscious of your steps. How many times did you go to the office water jug today? How many times to someone's office when perhaps you could have combined all assignments into one bundle for one trip? How many outside calls in your sales job did you make where you doubled back? A straight line could have saved you energy and gasoline. Go the straight line. Become step conscious. Follow a set pattern. One trick of making the day pass smoothly is to follow a pattern. You can walk miles even inside a home if you do it without thinking. But if you must think at each corner, shall I turn this way or that way today? Then you are soon weary. There are certain set daily patterns from getting up at certain time for a worker to shaving, eating, getting to work the usual way and having lunch at a certain time, returning home at the usual time. It's a pattern of life. You do these things without thinking and so without need to burn up energy. Let us therefore add a good rule and say, have set patterns to follow each day. In so doing, a housewife or office worker saves steps and energy and that is as good as finding a new pep pill. Here is how Mr. Energy starts the day by saving energy. His bathroom tasks are swiftly done from tooth polishing to shaving. He doesn't diddle and dally and soon is at breakfast, pleasant, friendly, and still with a cap on his energy tank. He isn't ready yet to uncork it. He is off to work, greeting people en route in easy manner, no rushing to make transportation, for he hasn't timed himself that closely. He arrives at the office and then uncorks his energy tank and starts his work, but again in an unhurried sure-footed manner of one who is master of his time and so master of how much energy he wants to turn on for each assignment. After such an easygoing day filled with action but held down tension, he corks up his energy and proceeds home with a tank that hasn't been emptied. The Time Waster But take Mr. Time Waster, the fiddler. Here's how he operates. He must arise one hour ahead of Mr. Energy and here's where his energy starts going out of his storage tank. He fiddles with gargles, eye washes, primping and pruning, hunting for shirts, neckties to match, some more garglings, more primping, lots of pruning, and he saunters into the kitchen for breakfast. Still an old fuss pot, he wastes time sipping and sipping and sipping his coffee finds himself running behind schedule and begins to uncork his energy for a mad rush to the office. He arrives breathless. He remains breathless all day long for he hasn't learned how to merchandise his time, uncorking energy a little here, some there, but not to let the entire tank run out of energy all at once. Mr. Time Waster hasn't learned the trick of operating his energy valves. The trick to use. The trick is to wean energy. A little here on unimportant matters, bigger doses for important things, a splurge for an emergency. But always keep your hand on the energy valve. If you control the outgo of energy through time saving devices, you'll always have energy in your tank for on the spot sudden use. George Crane, the learned writer, gives this energy saving advice in getting underfoot each morning without loss of movement and waste of time that deflates energy. Quote, each day fix in your mind a list of things to be done, your duties, your assignments and appointments. End quote. That's simple but sound advice. Fix in your mind a daily list of things to do. It's like driving a car on vacation. If you plan each day's trip, you won't run out of gas. If you plan each day's expenditures of energy, you won't run out of energy. Learn to step easier on your energy drive. Don't be heavy footed. Know where you are heading and how much energy it will take to get there or to complete that chore. And then you won't end up all pooped out.
nerves tense, and the grim look on your face of one who failed to time his energy and let it run wild. Make your energy stretch. Mechanical engineers have learned how to make energy stretch itself. Often with a series of gears, a little motor can run a big apparatus. And it is the same with man. He can learn how to make his energy do several jobs on the same amount of energy. For example, a worker has to go to a file. And as he goes, he distributes some papers to other workers that he must do and also gets a drink of needed water. That's three jobs on one piece of energy. If he had made three trips, he'd have burned up two thirds more energy. Multiply such waste all day long and you'll see that a penny of energy saved is a penny's worth on hand. Take Mrs. Housewife, the smart energy saving one. She puts a dust cloth in left hand, walks through the house with duster in the right hand. She does two jobs on the same walk. In fact, as she walks, she makes a mental list of shopping for the day. Three energy tasks on one ounce of energy. When she shops, she does so in a direct line. The laundry, the dry cleaning, the drugstore, the grocery, the gas station are all in logical order in her mind. Both she and her car save energy. She's a logical Mrs. Housewife, energetic too. But take Mrs. Tired Out. She rushes hither and yawn through a house trying to dust it, first with a dust cloth, then with the duster. First she is in one room, then thinks of something to be done in another room. Off she goes, burning up energy. She suddenly thinks, the shopping list. She drops what she's doing, loses the momentum she had gained on the work, and is off writing a shopping list only to return to the dusting again and having to turn on more energy to get her momentum going. Her shopping is done in the same illogical way. First one store, then another, then to another far part of town. The dry cleaning? Forgot it. Passed up the store. I'll return. My goodness, I'm about out of gas. Back down the street to the gas station. The pills, the pills. Where's the nearest drugstore? No wonder hubby finds her slumped in a chair, rag around her head, and she moans, You men have it easy. Harry White of the New York Sales Executives Club once stated, Inability of a person to pre-plan is the cause of most failures of top businessmen. They move like windmills in circles. What wastes energy? Sales Week magazine in a similar survey found that inefficiency, which burns up energy, was due to a person's making 65% of calls on wrong people. They further learned 80% of business was therefore done on only 20% of customers. Sellers failed to map their day's work and spun wheels, losing their stored up energy just trying to get from one place to another without a road map. Such a waste of energy. Decisions, decisions, decisions. Medical authorities tell you to put the sick person into a set pattern of rising, eating, exercising. This is relaxing. The patient need not worry about his food, what is to be done during the day, for it is all set for him. He conserves energy. He gets over his ailment quickly and returns to work with nerves in smooth running order. All because for a time he lived by a medical set pattern. Learn to live by little patterns each day, little ones to ease you along so that when a big decision must be made, you have the energy to handle it. So many little patterns you can slip into your day to give the body and nerves a rest from decisions, decisions, decisions. Another good method. Another way to maintain energy is to work smoothly. The person who gallops one minute then comes to a complete stop the next gets as far in life as the jackrabbit racing the turtle that plods on with constant speed. Seldom does the turtle do what the hare does, leap along at great speed, only to fall asleep along the way for needed rest. The winners of the gasoline millage race each year are those with the steady foot, not the one who speeds up, then slows down. The same with people. 
The person who rushes around a house half the morning only to fall on a lounge later on gets far less housework done than the person who goes about his chores in an easygoing manner with few jerks and stops. What burns out a motor or an electric light is the sudden surge of power going through it from being turned on. It is said by electrical engineers that an electric motor left on will run far longer than one turned off constantly to save it. You don't save it, for when it is turned on again and the surge of electricity goes through it, often the motor grunts from the shock and gives up. Most electric light bulbs blow out when lighted, not while burning. Note this. Note, too, how human motors conk out. The sudden rush upstairs often kills the heart victim. Famous last words include, let's walk up and save time. The elevator would have saved that sudden splurge of energy and knocked off the heart victim. Yet that same person, taking things in easy stride with a planned format of his day's activity, might well run the U.S. successfully for many years after a heart attack. Ask Ike Eisenhower. Ask Lyndon Johnson. Ask your favorite doctor. Tricks of the Trade Summed up you can make energy by saving it. Time can either drain you of energy or be used to save energy. It is all in how you merchandise your 1,440 minutes a day. One person runs in circles and burns energy fast. Another asks, is this necessary? And if so, then does the work in planned orderliness and saves energy. The art of Parceling out work in delegating assignments to others always saves you energy. When you can write a letter instead of making a personal call, when you can phone instead of writing a letter, you can save time and energy. Lastly, learn how not to stall on the job. Stalling on work you hate or want to delay burns up energy just thinking about it. As Robert Moses, the one-time Parks Department head of New York City, put it this way, Many projects never get off the ground because someone had made them too grandiose and they seemed impossible of accomplishment. So workers stalled. Moses had learned how to give assignments, piecemeal, and they didn't look formidable and people didn't waste energy thinking about them. There are tricks in all trades and one trick is to save time that saves energy, yet get things done. Chapter Success Story Kitty Wayland was a penniless refugee when she came to America a few years ago, a native of Berlin. She had escaped from the Russian zone, but had a plan and a straight line to follow that led her to America, where she is now Director of Executive Training on the staff of Magna Industries. The lady beams with pep and personality, but watch her work. She moves about easily, no sudden splurges and stops to shock her body. Yet, she has flash decisions to make and can do them. She has one big quality. She knows how to give assignments to others and save her own energy. She got started in America selling door to door. A friend encouraged her to sell, even though her English was sketchy and she had to memorize a pre-planned sales talk. She took driving lessons and soon owned a car when a sympathetic woman loaned her the down payment. As she went out on calls, she saved steps and each night she made a diagram of the streets to visit. She had to. Gasoline was costly. And so was her energy. She never drifted. She stuck to a work schedule that was below her plimsoll mark and emerged so filled with vim and vigor each day that she soon became a training director of the firm. Kitty had faith in her chosen field, faith in this new country, and faith in herself. For while she was known to work like a beaver, never was she worn to a frazzle, never did she have a case of nerves. I knew what I wanted and went along the road in easy manner, is the way Kitty would explain her great success story. Chapter Thought One method to save energy is to ask yourself, is this necessary? If the work isn't necessary for the moment, forget it and save energy. 1. It is foolish, for example, to sweep out the garage on a windy day. It only gets dusty and dirty the moment you finish. Put it off until another day 
and save energy. Two, is it really necessary to answer a letter today at near five o'clock or can it be put off until tomorrow? Why push energy needlessly? Three, is it necessary to see a person personally or on this particular assignment, won't a telephone call be just as good, saving you steps? Tip, don't backtrack. That's a great principle of saving energy. Walk in a straight line, oriental style, rather than from one side of the street to another. Straight lines save energy. Six energy saving rules. One, do a job completely, not half. Once the momentum of the job gets underway, don't stop. Keep momentum, the energy saver, in action. It takes a lot of energy restarting a job, more than if you finished it completely the first time. Two, do your work fully, not half-heartedly. It burns energy to piddle and diddle on a job. Put your full energy into the assignment and get it over with, then sit back and restore your energy. Three, gain job security. Nothing drains off energy faster than worry that you may lose your job. You come home nights in knots, tied up, frazzled. So set about making this job secure. You can then relax and let energy start building inside of you. Four, sneak enjoyment into your daily chores. Work that is a pleasure, even fun, uses less energy. So find a job you like or sneak enjoyment and fun into one that you don't like. Fun, like oil, makes gears work smoother with less loss of energy. Five, do work that doesn't give you the jitters. The jitters burn up energy. So try for work in life that is jitter-free. You'll go back home loaded with energy at close of each day's work. Six, don't let trifles irritate you. Learn to be trifle-proof. Take a firm attitude against trifles, the energy cheaters. They can worry out more energy than anything known to man. Put these rules to work for you and you won't have a mid-afternoon letdown, the four o'clock slump. End of chapter three. Let's head over to the next video where we're going to learn about how to banish emotional fatigue and compound energy.